Dear God, usually we're in the basement and now we're on the third floor and wherever we are, we know that you're with us. We thank you that you're a God who's always with us and we ask you to be here with us tonight as always teaching us and to be the only teacher that we have. Please help us to hear your voice, to understand it correctly, and please change us by your words in the ways that you most want us to change. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so <clears throat> welcome everybody. Um, in this class, as most of you know, <clears throat> we're studying the Minor Prophets, which are the last 12 books of the Old Testament. And we're studying the Minor Prophets <clears throat> in the order in which they appear in our Bible. So we started with Hosea. <clears throat> last week we finished Hosea, so tonight we're beginning the second of the Minor Prophets, which is Joel. And we'll easily have time to cover chapter one of Joel, and I, and I hope also some time to have some good discussion as well. So, <clears throat> as you'll remember from our study of Hosea, in the very beginning of Hosea, he gives us information about the people who were kings during his prophecy. And, and from that information, we could tell where Hosea was a prophet. We knew he was a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel. We could tell when he was a prophet. We knew that he was a prophet in the 8th century BC um, during the sort of declining days of the, of the northern kingdom. And all of that knowledge that we had about Hosea and his timing and his place you know, in, in the world helped us to understand the prophet and what he talked about. And of course, that's often the case when we study the Bible, that knowing the context helps us to understand the text so much better. Um, in case of Joel, we have very little information, almost, almost none. So if you look in verse 1 of Joel chapter 1, open up your Bible to, to Joel, look at the very beginning of Joel chapter 1, verse 1, and it's also on the screen here, too. That verse says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel, if I pronounce Bethuel's name right. And so, as I noted on the slide, the, the prophet Joel and his father are mentioned only one place in the Bible, and that's here. You can get on your computer and you can search for his father, and you'll find out that the only, the only place where his father's name appears is in verse 1, chapter 1 of Joel. <clears throat> if you look in the Bible for the name Joel, you'll find it because about 12 different people have the name Joel in the Bible, but none of them are this Joel. This particular Joel, the prophet Joel, is referred to only, only here. The name Joel literally means whose God is Jehovah, which is a good name for a prophet. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the fact that Joel is described in this way and that his father is mentioned would suggest maybe that the people in his day knew who he was and they knew who his father was. The way that the book begins with this superscription saying that this is the word of the Lord that came to Joel tells us that this is prophecy. Remember we talked about this in the beginning of our study of the Minor Prophets. A prophet is somebody through whom God speaks. A prophet of God only speaks the word of God. And so all of Joel, the book of Joel, we should understand to be God speaking through this man named Joel, about whom we know almost nothing. We know that he was a prophet of God and very little else. What we do not know and what Joel does not say is actually fairly interesting. Having just finished Hosea, sorry, this should say Joel, not Hosea. So please correct this slide. That's supposed to be 
。女王ですね。I've been typing Jose now for so many weeks. I, my fingers forgot to type something new. So. The, the prophet Joel, whose book we're studying now, does not even mention the northern kingdom of Israel. Remember, in Hosea, much was made of the fact that the northern kingdom had divided from the southern kingdom and so forth and so on, and that Hosea was a prophet in the northern kingdom, but Joel never even mentions the northern kingdom. In the prophet Hosea, we saw him mentioning the kings who ruled in both the northern and southern kingdom during his time as a prophet. Joel never even mentions a king or any other royal official, not even one, not even one time. Okay. We know that Assyria swept the northern kingdom away. We know that Babylon will later come and take the southern kingdom of Judah into captivity. The prophet Joel never mentions Assyria or Babylon as, as the world powers that they were during, during those centuries. And so it's, Hosea is remarkable for the things he doesn't talk about, actually, considering the fact that he was a prophet in, in that place and time. And when he speaks of Jerusalem, he speaks of Jerusalem as being a city in a kingdom that he describes as Israel, not, not as Judah. And you'll see through his prophecy that when he speaks of the city of Jerusalem and what he calls the kingdom of Israel, which might be the same as what Hosea would have called Judah, at that time the temple is standing and it's active because one of the things we'll see even in tonight's lesson he'll lament the fact that because of all the famine in the land they can't make offerings at the temple anymore which means the temple was standing and offerings were being made at the temple during the time of Joel. <clears throat> all of these things we can tell and mostly what we know about Joel's context is from things that he doesn't say. Okay. And so based on what Joel does not say scholars and churchmen down through the history have had all kinds of theories about when Joel wrote and, and where Joel wrote. And the, the range of dates among first class Bible scholars goes from guessing that Joel was a prophet in the ninth century before Christ at the earliest, all the way up to some people who say that Joel was a prophet in the second century before Christ. And so we have a, a period of six or seven hundred years there, a range of opinions by different people regarding when the prophet Joel might, might have written. Literary critics who analyze words and texts have compared Joel to a lot of the other prophets, and you can see a lot of quotation happening between Joel and Isaiah, between Joel and Amos, and so you can see that there are connections between Joel and the other prophets. They, they read each other, or they drew from the same pool of, of prophetic, prophetic thought. But all of these things that people can study and people can talk about have never been able to settle the question of the date or the specific historical context of when Joel was, was a prophet. And so I would say to you, based on the, the time I spent sort of reading up on all of that, that when we read Joel, we can only read Joel without the benefit of that kind of context. We don't know where, we don't know when, we don't know all the stuff like we did for, for Hosea. And I would say furthermore that we should read Joel without importing any historical context that we, we suppose may or may not be true. Because the Holy Spirit could have put that information there if he wanted us to have it and he didn't. We have the text that we, that we do have from, from a prophet speaking uh, with, with less context. And one of the things I think, I've, I've thought about this and I'll continue thinking about this, that makes this something different about Joel than reading Hosea. When we read Hosea, we're also doing history. We're thinking about specific chains of events that happened in the history of the northern and southern kingdom and how the prophets spoke about that. But with Joel, we're reading something sort of like a Psalm of David that could be liturgy. I mean, it could be something that the church could read at all times in history and still derive the same message from that. It speaks the same message into the northern kingdom, into the southern kingdom, into the intertestamental period, into the New Testament period, into the modern church, the things that Joel says apply the same everywhere, the more so because we're lacking the historical context. We don't need the context to understand what Joel was talking about. I think you'll see. And it may be missing by the grace of God for our, for our benefit. So we can see the basic message that comes through Joel is timeless. At least that's the way it seems. 
I mean, in any case, it would be wrong to invent a context because we don't have one. Okay, so we're not allowed to do that with the Bible. We just have to, to, to note that we don't have that information. <clears throat> I haven't been outlining books a lot because I like us to read and, and sort of discover the, the things as we read through rather than starting with, with an outline. But this is such a short little book, only four chapters, that you can yourself can just flip a couple of pages and, and what you might figure out real quickly just by your eye is that the basic pattern of what, what Joel has to say is sort of this one. He's saying, things are bad now. We have a really bad situation now. Let's wake up and notice things are bad now. Okay, that's the first part. Chapter one tonight will be all in that part. Things are bad. Please notice things are bad. <clears throat> then he says, that the things that are bad now are a, a harbinger, we would say in English, a, a warning of things to come that will be even worse because the day of the Lord is coming. Okay. And that will be a bad day for people who aren't right with God and a great day for people who are. But things are bad now and things will become worse for those who are separated from God while they become better for, for people who are with God. And because things are bad now, and because the, the, the day of the Lord is coming, the prophet will say, repent, turn back to God, all right, take, take your chance, God is giving you a clue, all right, through, the, through these disasters that you have, God is warning you, take this opportunity to turn back to him, and then the prophet ends with wonderful promises about how people who turn back to God will be okay, right, and this is very... Not so different from Hosea and all the other prophets. We see this in biblical prophecy. People are shown what's bad about now. They're warned about what's bad that's coming. The message is almost always the same. Turn back to God. That's where life is. That's where blessing is. And if you turn back to God, God promises that things are going to be great. All right. That's basically the, the pattern or the theme or the plot or however you want to say of what's going to happen in Joel. And tonight... We're on the left side where the prophet will just be talking about what's bad in his day. But the rest of this will be coming in the next week or two until, until we finish. Okay, so that's, that's a little bit of, of introduction about Joel that may be helpful. Now let's just go ahead and read it. And I don't, I, as I said, I don't think it's going to take a lot of time to go, to go through chapter 1. So... Let's read verses 2 and 3. Joel chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 are this way. It says, Hear this, you elders. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children to another generation. Okay, so, sorry. So he begins in, in, in verses 2 and 3, crying out to people and saying, listen to me, hear, hear this. And he begins, first of all, with the elders, okay? And the word elder can have two possible meanings. It can have the meaning leaders. Remember I mentioned Joel never talks about kings or, or leaders like that, but he does speak of the elders of the people. And, and often in the Bible, an elder is someone who's a leader or, or who's responsible but it also just means old people. And, and it can mean both things, and usually does mean both things. So as the prophet cries out and says, hear this, he wants to speak, first of all, to people who are actually old and who may also be you know, uh, leaders of, of, of the people. And he's saying, listen to me, but not just you guys, not just the leaders, not just the old people, but all of the inhabitants of the land. So his message goes out to everybody in the land, starting with its, its older and, and people in, in leadership. And then he asks them a question. He says, has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? All right, so if you talk to old people, they'll always remember, like, you know, I'm getting there myself. You know, I can remember you know, 56 years worth of stuff that happened already. And I say, well, I, nothing's new, right? I saw this before. I saw that before. I've had this experience before. That's the way old people are. But the prophet is saying to the old people, first of all, ask yourself, have you ever seen anything like this, what's happening now? Okay. Has such a thing happened in your days? Or you listen to your fathers, it means your father, your grandfather, or you know, the, the, the fathers of the people. 
have you ever heard about anything like this that ever happened in, in the nation? That's his question. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? And the answer, of course, that he expects them to give is no. Okay? The, it's a question designed to draw this response. If these people start searching their memory and try to find something like what's happening now, they won't find it in their life, they won't find it in the lifetime of their father, they probably won't find it in the lifetime of their grandfather. If they keep going back, they're going to find it in the life of Moses and the people in captivity in Egypt because similar things did happen then. And probably the prophet means to send their brain back there to say, what's happening now is as important as what happened when Moses caused the locusts to attack Pharaoh. I mean, that's how far back they're going to have to go to find some similar experience to what they're having now. Right? So this is a memorable, special, noteworthy time that they're living in. And he, he, he wants the old people to notice that, but he wants all the people to, to notice that also. That, that this is so is, is further supported by verse 3, where he says, tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. So what's happening in the time of Joel the prophet is something which is out of living memory, which is you'd have to go back into biblical history to find something like it. And it's important so that just like they teach the Torah to their children and they tell them stories of Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the rest, they should be teaching their children stories about these days now, what's happening now. What's happening is so important that they'll be teaching future generations about it. Right. Okay, so this is in fact a lesson for the ages, like the other things that are recorded in the Bible. And when you read verse 3, tell your children, let your children tell their children, it's supposed to remind you of Deuteronomy. I mean, if you go back in the Old Testament, you remember Moses telling the people, tell your children, tell their grandchildren, tell people about the Lord, don't forget, right? Don't forget what the Lord has, has done. So the things happening in Joel's place are on par with the things that were happening in Egypt in the time of, of Pharaoh, I, I dare say. And at any rate, they're really noteworthy, important, and they're supposed to draw an important lesson from the things that are happening now, right? Because people are going to be reading about this stuff for generations to come. And in fact, here we are. We're, we're, we're reading, it, reading it here. 2,000 years later, we're still reading it, right? And the pictures I had up were just to try to give you a sense of, in the background is a picture, actually a picture of, of a locust swarm attacking someplace in modern times. And that's, as you'll see in the, in the next couple verses, the disaster that they're having is an attack of locusts. Locusts are grasshoppers, basically, who are kind of supercharged to, to, you know, by, by their environmental conditions to swarm sometimes. And when they swarm, they really do huge damage. And actually, I wasn't going to talk about this, but I read someplace that in, in certain parts of the world where locusts can be a problem, they actually use satellites and other modern surveillance technology to watch for locusts that might come. And then if they see a swarm of locusts forming, they'll send like airplanes with insecticide and chemicals and stuff like that to kill them before they come. Because even in modern times, if you don't kill them quick, if you don't kill them before the locusts sort of form, they'll wipe out everything. I mean, it's, it's almost like an atomic bomb dropped on your country because they're going to eat up everything if they come. And so that was the kind of problem they were having. You may think it's just a bunch of bugs, but if you, if you lived in the Middle East in those times, it'd be a serious, serious problem, as the prophet will, will keep saying and saying. And so that's the background of my picture. That's the disaster. And the prophet is saying, look around you. Have you ever seen anything like this in your lifetime? Did your dad see it? Did your grandpa see it? No. So you better tell your children, and they better tell their, their children, because what's happening now is important. You're supposed to teach you something that you need to know. These locusts are, okay? That's the starting point of, of Joel's prophecy through verses 1, 2, and 3. And when the locusts are done, there's nothing left. The picture up there now is supposed to be a picture of some place where the locusts cleaned out a, a cornfield, but the, the bugs come and they eat up everything. All right, and, and in, verses, in verse 4 is where you see for sure that what we're talking about is locusts. So verse 4 says, what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping locust left, 
the destroying locust has eaten. Right. And so now it's clear that the devastation that they're supposed to take note of and understand is caused by locusts, you know, swarms of grasshoppers that come to destroy all of the plants and things in their, in their land. Here are mentioned four different sort of, it seems like four different kinds of, of locusts, cutting and swarming and hopping and, and destroying is the way they're described. And pretty much nobody thinks that these are four different kinds of locusts in a biological sense. Or that they really came at four rather separated points in time. The point seems to be that wave after wave after wave of locusts came until there was nothing left for the locusts to eat anymore. They had eaten everything up. The only thing that may be significant about the way that they're described here is the number four. Because usually in the Bible, when something is described in four different ways in parallel like it is here, one of the things that the prophet is trying to tell you is it's, it's complete, it's, it's ecumenical, it's total. North, south, east, and west, the four corners of the compass, it's covered, the locust destroyed everything. Now, people, you, can, you may wonder, if we look in history outside of the Bible, can we figure out which locust swarm the prophet is talking about? And the, and the answer is no. Very big and, and widely destructive swarms of locusts weren't very common, but they were common enough that we can easily see that this is something that did happen in, in the world in those days. They didn't have any technology to stop it. And it would happen when, when the climate was right and when you know, everything, the, the, the conditions were right for, for such a swarm to, to break out. And so it's totally believable that this would have happened in, in Israel in those days, but it's not possible to connect it with any historical record outside of the Bible of a particular swarm of, of, of locusts. And that's really not the point. As I said before, the prophet Joel seems to be speaking a message that would be relevant, read in church over the ages, right? And so it doesn't actually so much matter that we know which particular swarm of locusts this was. We should, I think, though, understand that he's talking about a real swarm of locusts. This is not, um, this is not allegory. He's not pretending that they're locusts to say something else. This is also not something that he sees happening in the future. He's talking about a real attack of locusts in his day. That seems almost certain from just reading the, the text. It's literal and it's present okay, in, in his day. So you'd think they would notice, but in verse 5, he says, in, Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. So this may refer to people literally who are prone to drunkenness. The, 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 the spiritual state of affairs in Israel in those days was not great. Probably people were prone to, to drunkenness, which would not be pleasing to the, to the Lord. <clears throat> drunkenness can also be used as a metaphor for other things because a person who's drunk is not sort of seeing what's going on around them in the right way. Um, they may be laughing and happy even though lots of bad things are happening. People are driven to drink to escape from bad things so that they won't notice. So a person who's drinking might be insensible to what's going on in the world around them and to what it means. And so when the prophet says, awake you drunkards, he may be speaking to people who are drunk he may also be speaking to people who just have a foggy consciousness of what's going on uh, around them. People, anyway, who needed to be prodded and awakened, say, wake up, wake up, look what's, what's happening in the world around you, this thing like you've never seen before and you have to tell your, your grandchildren about. This is a really bad situation. You better notice is what the, the prophet is saying. And, of course, people who are literally fond of alcohol are going to be sad because the locusts have, have eaten up all of the grapes and there's not going to be any wine anymore. And so they'll be specifically disappointed. That's the empty wine glass at, at the bottom and the guy up here is sad because there's no more, there's no more alcohol is coming. But the same will be true for people who are fond of, of beef and, and who are fond of eating and who are, who are fond of, of, of clean water and, and a happy life is Everyone in the kingdom that was used to having such a good life in, in, in the promised land right now 
is going to be sad because all of those good things, not just the alcohol, has been taken away. So, so I, I don't know if drunkenness is specifically singled out here, but certainly it's a larger phenomenon th than that. He wants people to wake up and notice what's what's going on. And so then <clears throat> verses 6 and 7 continue, and it says, For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. So the vast majority of, of, of commentators on the Bible will, will agree that here when, when he says, a nation has come up against my land, he's still talking about the grasshoppers. All right? he, he's, he's speaking of the, the grasshoppers, the locusts, anthropomorphically. He, he's pretending like they're an army because, in effect, this whole bunch of swarms of grasshoppers that are coming destroy the country as well as any army possibly could do. And if, if you get down and you look at the, the guys, they come in, in ranks and they, they attack wave after wave after wave like, like an army would. And if you look at them really close, they have teeth, you know, like a lion and fangs of a lioness. And what do they do is not something that you would describe an army as having done. But they, these, these grasshopper armies, they lay waste the vine, they splinter my fig tree, they strip off the bark, throw it down, and the branches are made white, which is the picture I have in the lower right-hand corner here. So I think still the, the, the prophet's talking about the, the, the swarms of, of um, locusts that are coming as if they were an army sent to destroy the, 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 the land. I will say that there are some commentators who I really respect a lot who, who actually think that the prophet may be seeing a second calamity, namely that there was locusts that came, but maybe some army also took advantage of it. And, and, and I don't think so, but, but, but I just mentioned for the sake of completeness that you could read that here, and you, you wouldn't be alone. If it says a nation has come up against my land, we know, in fact, that, that first the Assyrians and then the Babylonians do come up against them. So he could be referring to a real nation, a real army, but it seems like he's sticking mostly with, with, uh, with the disaster that's brought by the, by the insects, I think. And it, and it really doesn't matter because I think the continuing point of Joel and how the church has read it for, for thousands of years now is we need to understand what this kind of disaster means to God's people, what's the proper lesson to take from such a disaster when it happens, and then once we understand that, we need to pass it along to successive generations the way the prophets started out, because this is a lesson for all time that you teach to the generations, not just about what's happening in a, in a certain place in a certain time only once. If that were true, you wouldn't teach it to your children and your grandchildren, right? It's, it's a spiritual lesson that's being taught. Right, so the proper reaction to the kind of disaster that they're seeing in the land that's caused by these, these locusts is lament. Okay. Verses 8 through 10 read as follows. It says, lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth, sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn, the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. <clears throat> so here in these verses 8, 9, and 10, we have, the, you know, uh, in fuller detail, the picture of the sad state of affairs in, in the prophet's day. And he's instructing the people, is God through, through Joel, is instructing the people to lament. Lament means to... to What's a simple word for lament? To express extreme sadness, you know, to, to wail and, and to grieve, to, to lament. Because that's what you should do. This is a very serious situation, you drunken people. You know, wake up and pay attention. You, know, you should lament. <clears throat> and he says, to make it plain, lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. 
you, you understand, you know, I think when husbands and wives are separated by death, it's always tragic, but it, it's going to be felt most severely by a young wife and a young husband who are just have met each other and they've just betrothed to get married and, and the woman is in love with her young bridegroom and then he, he's die, he dies, he's killed in a war by accident or sickness. That kind of grief that the woman would be experiencing is maybe one of the most extreme kinds of grief human beings would, would suffer. The prophet wants to make sure that it's that kind of lament he's talking about, which is a picture that's not exactly sackcloth, but it helps you understand that it would be a young bride bereft of her husband. <clears throat> just inconsolable. I mean, she'd be so sad there would be nothing that you could do for her. <clears throat> That's the kind of lament the prophet expects people to feel for the situation in, in, their, in, their, in their place and their, their time. It's not only that, it's, it's that they've, been, they've had their promised land taken away from them, like this, this young bride. But the grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. You have to understand these people, if you read your Old Testament, the whole worship of Yahweh is connected to the tabernacle and the temple and to drink offerings and grain offerings and, and animal sacrifices that are burned on the altar. The whole way to worship Yahweh is connected to agricultural produce. If you don't have grain, if you don't have wine, if you don't have cattle, if you don't have sheep, if you don't have birds, if you don't have water, you can't worship Yahweh, right? The, the, the way that they were taught by the Lord to worship him is impossible in a land that has no crops. All right? And so not only is the situation itself bad, but, but even, even worse, which is why the, the priests mourn, the ministers of the Lord mourn, is because they can't worship God anymore. They can't go to the temple and, and, and do the, the acts of worship that God has taught them, them to do. And so... It's as if God himself has kicked them out of the temple. They can't go there and do their, do, do their, their business anymore. And of course, we know, having just read the prophet Hosea, that it's not God that's rejected them, but it's, it's them who's rejected God, right? I mean, they've turned away from God. <clears throat> and the circumstance that they find themselves in is a result of that, right? God is not just tormenting them for no reason. They've turned away from God. And it's brought this very difficult circumstance on them. So I don't know if you can see or, or care, but my picture is in, in the left. There's a picture of a church with the broken windows, you know, knocked out. You know, that's how it would feel. How would you feel if, in addition to, to the loss you're grieving at, the loss of your spouse, you know, you went to your church looking for God, but, but the doors were closed, the windows were broken out. You couldn't go to him anymore because the... the for now, at least, the, the, the line to God has been cut because they, they've turned away from God. And so your religious leaders, instead of helping you and sacrificing for you, they're wailing and weeping and moaning. They're no good to you either. That's a, wolf, uh, a weeping rabbi <laughs> there. Okay, so that's, this is the kind of situation that we're supposed to understand they have. All right? They're very sad, and they should recognize how sad it is, and they should lament if they really understand. And the prophet tells them <coughs> that their lament, their, their great sadness now, should proceed to shame. All right? They should be ashamed of the circumstance in which they find themselves. Now, this is a tricky point. It would be wrong to say that every time someone is in distress, they should be ashamed. And I want to talk about that in, in a minute. That's not what the prophet's saying. But these people should be ashamed because they've destroyed themselves by turning away from God. All right? They've turned away from God. The situation that they're in is the result of their apostasy, of their sin, right, of their disobedience. And so they should be ashamed. Verse 11 says, Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple, all the trees of the field are dried up. And gladness dries up from the children of man. All right, so this is a situation that's happening to them in the day of Joel, but it is a situation that has happened to men in other places at other times many, many times since then. And every time a people finds themselves in this situation where they're in great distress and they realize that they brought the distress on themselves because they turned away from God, because they're living in a way that's not pleasing to God, 
the gladness dries up from the children of men. And they should read Joel because this prophecy is there in the Bible to be read at times such as that. Just the way certain psalms are in the Bible to be read at times such as this, right? This is the time when they're ashamed because of their distress, because they've brought it on themselves, if they'll only, only understand that. For them, at this time of place, their poverty physically is a sign of their poverty spiritually. Now, I want to hit pause here and make sure that we, we don't take the long, long lesson. Right. So I wanted to ask you all, and I hope that you'll answer so I don't have to do all the talking. Do you think that all hardship that human beings suffer is punishment? Because in the prophecy we've just read, the prophet has told the people, this is punishment. You should be ashamed of the circumstances you've brought on yourself by your own sin. Okay. That's their circumstance, and it's not so rare. That happens a lot of times in, in human history. But it's, my question is, every time we see people in distress, should we understand that those people are being punished for something, do you think? <coughs> and the answer is no, right? Of, of, of course not. John 16, 33, which, which is my favorite verse in the Bible, I think. Jesus says, you know, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the, I have overcome the world. Right? And I have a picture of the cross in the background for a reason. There's a great deal of suffering that happens in the world, which is, which is not punishment for the sins of the one punished. Right? We're instructed to take up our cross and follow after Jesus. The Apostle Paul suffered greatly because he was loyal to, to God in, in Christ. Many godly people suffer because they're godly people. Right? And so the answer, of course, is that hard, not, all, not all hardship is punishment. Right? On the contrary, some of the time we see people in, in great distress and great hardship, they're being honored by God and allowed to participate in the suffering of Christ. Right? So, Joel is telling a certain group of people they should be ashamed and they should wail and weep and moan and pretty soon he's going to tell them put on sackcloth and fast and pray because you've got to turn back to God before this gets out of hand. Right? Your, your circumstance is a warning. Turn back to God. So sometimes hardship is that way. Joel is talking about that kind of a case. But so many times right, it's not that way. Right? And we, we can't just tell because people have a hard time that they're being punished. No. You, you can't tell that. The second question I have, though, is hard, a harder question maybe to, to answer. And maybe I don't know quite 100% for sure what the right answer is. But do you think all hardship is, is, is beneficial? In the case of Joel, he's saying this hardship is going to be beneficial. Wake up, see it, know what it is, tell your children about it. Turn to God, put on sackcloth, fast, pray, and then he's going to say later, the Lord will turn back to you, right? And so the suffering is beneficial because it saves them from going to hell, right? It's, it's a favor God is doing them by leading them into a difficult situation with a bunch of, bunch of grasshoppers so they know it's time to turn back to God. But what about other cases? Would you say other, other cases of suffering, are they all beneficial? What do you think, Mark? You have that look in your eye. Uh, I, I, I think so. Um, if you read Romans 8.28, you know, for God's glory and for your future benefits. Maybe not. I had the same thing here. Because some, some of you read Romans 8.28, 8, please. My question was, is all hardship beneficial? Mark's answer is yes. And then he cites Romans 8.28 as proof of his answer. That's exactly the, the, the verse that came to my mind also. Who has it? I got it. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Okay. So the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, would seem there and at other places to be saying that, that hardship 
is good. And Paul frequently rejoices in his suffering because it's suffering for the Lord. Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross and he saved the entire, entire world through his suffering. And we're invited to suffer with him so that we can be instruments of his grace to other people. Suffering that leads us back to God, such as the case before the prophet Joel, is, is, is good because it's leading us back to God, right? <clears throat> so I don't know if, I, if, we're, if there's any exceptions, but I'm, I'm inclined to, to quickly come to the same conclusion that you did. Is all hardship beneficial? And I have to say, yes. And yet it leaves us with some real mysteries, right? I mean, like, what about tsunamis and earthquakes and children who die before they're born and all kinds of tragic things that, that, that we can see in the world? We don't see the good in it, right? We just can't. And you can't comfort a mother whose child has been killed in an automobile accident by saying, oh, it's, it's, it's for your benefit. You don't say that, right? That's just evil to say something like that to somebody. And yet, if, if we knew all that God knew, and, it, and if we understand the heart of God the way Hosea helped us to understand the heart of God as a loving father, I suspect that if we knew enough, we would realize that all hardship is beneficial. Michael, do you have a, 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 a pushback on that? Well, it mentions in the scripture that was just read that it, things work together for those who love God. So I think perhaps people who do not know God may look at hardship differently and they may they may harden their heart towards God if they believe him responsible. That's, that's a very good point that needed to be made. So <clears throat> the passage in, in Romans 8.28 says, all things work together for those who love God. So for God's children, we know because Christ told us <clears throat> that we're going to suffer. Right? All human beings suffer. <clears throat> and he said, take heart, I've overcome the world. And so whatever suffering is given to us, and some people suffer more and some people suffer less, but if we're children of God, we all wind up living a blessed eternal life with Christ in heaven. And so it, it's easy to, to accept the fact that for, for, for children of God, everything works out in the end, right? And, and that we'll find out later that God had a reason, a loving reason for every bit of hardship that, that we suffered. If we're not children of God, the, the answer would seem to be different, right? Um, although you, you, could, you could say that the same hardship that leads God's children to him it is the same hardship that doesn't lead some people to him, and these are the ones who, by reasons we don't understand, are not, not going to be the, the children of God. So that, I suppose that's a very deep philosophical question, but all or most hardship, and certainly all hardship for children of God, could be considered to be a good thing, even if we don't understand why. Right? And so many times we don't understand why, which is why I, I asked the last question, and it's not such a silly question, maybe, as it seems to be, I hope, is all hardship, hardship, right? So, so we just said it up above, all things work together for the good of those who are called according to God's purpose. So I, could I say, oh, then, then all hardship is, is a good thing. Well, no, hardship is still hardship, right? So in Mark chapter 14, verses 34 through 36, you can read Jesus himself before he's crucified. Let's just look there because I think it's instructive. Mark 14, 34 through 36. And, and this is just one of the several places in the Synoptic Gospels where you can read this. So Jesus is speaking. He says, and he said to them, that's his disciples, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Which means to say that for the Son of God, suffering was still suffering. When Jesus went to the cross, he suffered. When we follow Jesus carrying our cross, we suffer. When God tests us, when, when, when God allows Satan to tempt us, when all of the bad things and all of the reasons why they come, suffering is suffering. 
and we shouldn't pretend otherwise. And so if, you, if one of your Christian brothers and sisters is suffering, there's nothing wrong to pray that God will take it away. Jesus prayed to take it away. Pain is pain, suffering is suffering. And yet, for those who, who love God, we have one big advantage that non-believers don't have, and that's we know that even if we can't understand why we're suffering, there's a happy ending to our story. And Rick Warren, one of his famous things was, God never wastes a hurt, meaning th there's no pain that you suffer as a Christian that isn't finally good for something. God knows what it is. <coughs> Would anybody add anything? This is just my effort to correct. I don't want us to think that when Joel tells them to be ashamed because they're suffering, that, that that's always true. It's true for the people the prophet is talking to. And the reason why we know it is because God grabbed the prophet and spoke through him to tell them this. You guys need to be ashamed. You need to turn back to God. This is a sign to save you from your own sin, from which you're suffering, right? That's the message for Joel. Okay. But that's not always the message that's spoken to people who suffer, especially Christians. And there's a reason why the people that the prophet is speaking to are suffering. And we get it and start getting into verses 13 and 14. He gives them instructions now. He said, wake up and look at, your, look at your bad situation. Appreciate how bad it is. And now he says in verse 13, put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Well, O ministers of the altar, <clears throat> go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. So in, in the current circumstances, of, as we've said, the proper thing to do is, is to, to, to lament and to turn to God and to pray. And sackcloth, which I tried to put in the background, is just rough, like burlap or something, some kind of rough material like you make sacks out of. So oftentimes in the Bible, when people say they put on sackcloth and they fast and they pray, <clears throat> they're putting uncomfortable clothes on themselves and they're denying themselves food because they think that this will what? In itself, those things do nothing. But they can be an assistant to prayer. So if they're trying to, to pray fervently to God, sincerely to God, People may put on sackcloth and fast as, a, as an effort to, to sort of combat their own weakness of their flesh and so they can pray, pray better to God. And so Joel begins with the religious leaders here. He says to those guys, because they're kind of responsible for the bad state of affairs in the country as pastors are, put on sackcloth and lament to the priests, to the ministers of the altar. And he says, you guys go prepare yourself by spending the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. <laughs> because right now nothing is happening in the temple because there's no grain and there's no drink and the people are separated from the worship of their God and this is a bad thing for God's chosen people and we have to ask God to fix it. We need to go to God as the only one who can fix this kind of problem. We need to go and ask him, but not just the priests and not just the ministers of the altar, but verse 14 says, we'll consecrate a fast. Fast means people aren't going to eat for a while. And a solemn assembly means we're not going to pray alone in our private rooms. We're going to get together at, and fast and pray to, together. All of the inhabitants of the land are going to go to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. So they're going to gather in the temple in Jerusalem, dressed in sackcloth without any dinner, and they're going to pray, pray to God. And the whole point is that as a group, they're going to cry out sincerely to Yahweh. To, to let them come back and to give them help in their time of trouble. And, and that is the, the purpose, I dare say, of, of what's gone before, is Joel wants them to realize that their difficult circumstance is supposed to lead them back to God in prayer. And that's a true thought, and he'll return to it. But then something else occurs to him, which he'll go into much more detail in chapter 2, as we'll study next week. In, in verse 15, the prophet says, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. All right. And so 
they have a present difficulty and obviously this is not the day of the Lord otherwise what would be the point of him telling them remember this difficult circumstances and tell your children and your grandchildren and generations to come is addressing a, a real life problem in their time that they expect to take that lesson future to, to future generations but at the same time every disaster that befalls God's people as we said before is a kind of a blessing somehow and one of the ways in which it's a blessing is it is a reminder, a warning, a step helping to prepare us before the day of the Lord, when the Lord comes to judge all things. Because on the day of the Lord, then it's game over. The people who are God's people will be healed and restored and justice will be, will be there. And the people who aren't God's people and all the wickedness in all the earth will be put away and destroyed forever so that what's left will be perfectly good and pleasing to God, right, on the day of, on the, day of the Lord. And that day is coming to us too and so if we have a difficulty brought on by our own sin and God sends us a difficult circumstance to wake us up <clears throat> and it drives us back to him in prayer and we're reconciled with God that's all to the good because that's where we need to be on the day of the Lord when God comes back we want to be on, on his side not any place else and so I think that's the point here is, is the prophet is saying there's more than one reason you need to turn to God. You need to fix the problem with the grasshoppers. But you need to get right with your God before this world is brought to a close and the new heaven and the new earth are created because on that day, the people who are with God will be the ones who are saved. And you know, the people of God, that is the Jews, God's chosen people, were often made the mistake of thinking because they were God's chosen people, no matter what, they were going to be okay. They thought the day of the Lord was a day when God was going to come deal with the Gentiles, when God was going to come punish the nations which had oppressed Israel. But what they begin to learn through the prophets Hosea and Joel and the rest of the prophets that we'll read is the same thing is true in the kingdom of Israel, right? There are some people who are really of Israel and some people who aren't, right? As Paul will teach later. And even God's chosen people by birth need to be careful to make sure that they really are with God or not. They shouldn't assume so. And the fact that they can suffer in the land of promise, where the temple is, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Israel, that a bunch of grasshoppers can come and wipe out this whole land and everything there belongs to God, should be a real wake-up call to them because it means they're not right with God. If they were right with God, stuff like that wouldn't happen. The prophet is saying, with the word of the prophet added, they can be sure that they're taking the right lesson from their circumstances. All right, so anyway, the, the, this judgment day is coming, and they need to turn back to God for that reason, too. And then we're, we're almost out of time, but I just actually have one or two more slides. I, the last verses, 17 through 20, are kind of a return to, to most of the same themes which we've already seen about the, 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 the condition in the land. So verse 17 says, The seed shrivels under the clods, the storehouses are desolate, the granaries are torn down because the grain has dried up. So you understand not just this year's harvest, the stuff that was growing and eaten up by the grasshoppers, but the stuff they had in store that might provide for the future and seed corn for the coming spring when they might plant. All of that stuff has been badly damaged by, by, by the locusts is the, is the sense of verse 17. And the animals, at least, verse 18, are smart enough to know this. It says, how the beasts groan. The herds of cattle are perplexed <clears throat> because there's no pasture for them, and even the flocks of sheep suffer. And I wanted to put up pictures of perplexed cows and, and suffering or angry sheep. <clears throat> the, the, the point here is, I believe, the animals are smarter than the people. The people are drunk in their sin and their stupidity, perhaps literally drunk or figuratively drunk, but the prophet actually has to tell them, hey guys, this is a very serious situation. Wake up and turn back to God. At least you'll be destroyed and found in this state on the day of the Lord even. The animals know something's wrong. They're perplexed. They're hungry. They can tell that, that something's, something's wrong. And animals are, are, are that way. You know, when, when a cow is hungry, they, they become agitated. You know, they know something's wrong. They're, they may not be geniuses, but they know they're hungry. And they know if somebody doesn't find food pretty quick, 
they're going to be in trouble, right? And so I think the prophet now involves the animals just to show that the animals can sense something is wrong, even if the people can. <laughs> so in verse 19, the prophet says, To you, o, o Lord, I call, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and flame has burned all the trees of the field. Probably this is not describing a wildfire. In, in California, in some places, and you know, you'll see this actually happen. This may just be figurative language. The heat of, of the east wind blowing in off the desert, you know, has dried everything up as if it were a fire. Probably not a, it might not be a real fire. <laughs> Even the beasts of the field pant for you because the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Right. So the animals know what's going on. The people better recognize what's going on. And not only should they recognize it's serious in their time and place because they need to turn to God and ask for healing in the land, that God will restore rain and crops and, and, and like that, which he obviously does because <clears throat> this prophecy survived to this day. The people didn't die out because of these locusts. But more to the point, they've been asked to recognize through this experience that they have a problem with God. And the day of the Lord is coming and they better, they better take this lesson and teach it to their children and get themselves right with God. And my last slide, which I like the best, is, is I, I stole this idea from Pastor Tikesi, I, I, I confess, because he uses this, this idea sometimes. But on the left is a picture of a frog sitting in water. And, and the, the story is that if you take a frog and you put a, a frog in a pan of cold water, it'll sit there. And then you can turn the fire on, and if you heat the water gradually, the frog will never know that he has a problem until he's dead, because he can only sense changes in temperature, but he can't really sense that he's getting in danger because the water is heating up so slowly. And so I think it's a good kind of silly way to remember what Joel is talking about, maybe, because, and, and I ask us, you know, how we would apply this in our lives. Have, have you ever failed to notice a problem? At first, I, I mean, oh, maybe, a, maybe a, a, it could be a financial problem or a work problem or something, just like the people in, in Joel's nation have problems with their crops. It could be a spiritual problem. They think they're God's chosen people. There's no problem. They're right with God. But now suddenly circumstances call that into question, and a prophet like Joel shows up and says, you people are in trouble. You better put on sackcloth and pray and fast and turn back to your, your God before the, the day of the day of the Lord. Right? And that's how hopefully some of them will finally notice they have a problem, and, and hopefully the result will be many of them will be saved. <clears throat> but I'm just thinking in my own life, I have this kind of experience too sometimes. I just wondered if you guys have also. <clears throat> Did you ever have a problem? You didn't even realize it for a long time until finally God did something to bring it to your attention? Yes? Is it, is it too embarrassing to share with the class? <laughs> Most of mine are. <laughs> it's too embarrassing to share with the class? <laughs> okay. Yeah. This is not a personal situation, but just now, you mentioned in Joel here, some of you know that Felipe and I have a home on the island of Hawaii, and about 23 years ago on our island, there was a very devastating hurricane that destroyed many homes and many lives. And shortly after that hurricane, the, the, the county council, the ruling leaders of the island, asked the pastor of our church to come. And they said, Please pray for us because we have turned from God. Look what's happened. We cannot put our island together. Please pray for us. We need humility. So much of this I was reminded of. Well, so that's an example of, of a natural disaster that people have understood as a wake-up call to turn back to, to God. Yes. Which is, they would be the ones best able to decide that, right? <clears throat> and, yet, and yet we wouldn't say everyone who's affected by a natural disaster is being punished or something like that. But they perceive that, right, as these people. Any the other example? Maybe for us, maybe 
for me is so that I could notice all oh, he's going to be in trouble, but uh, for myself, myself, this guy should notice all he's going to be in trouble. Yeah. I think, like, for just for example, um, you know, you could be leading a, a life that's not right with God either because you have sin or you're not paying enough attention to your relationship with God or something like that. You're working too much. And you could become physically ill, for example. And it, it could be very serious, but as a result of that, you might God might be helping you to realize that you need to change your life in some ways. <coughs> And later, you may even look back and realize that is, was a blessing, you know, even though it seemed like a difficult time. I think a lot of people have that, right? I, mean, I, I had some problem with my heart five or six years ago, which caused me to change my life in ways that I, I think are good for, for me. So, I think other people may have mental illness, you know, you, you, you may be living a life that's really unbalanced, whether you're taking drugs or, or you're, you know, caught in some kind of bad, you know, behavior. And one of the ways that, that some people causes them to become mentally ill, right? And that may really be a case where all you can do is turn to God and say, please help me, I don't know what to do because mental illness is a really puzzling thing, usually. Um, or your marriage might break up, or, or your children might have a problem, or, uh, and so forth and so on. So I think that a lot of things, if you look back in your own life, looking backwards, you can see <coughs> this bad thing happened, but actually, it wasn't so bad, you know, God used it in some way that turned out to be quite good. And, you know. Or business failure is something you see a lot of times people. I've been in a couple of situations like this where I don't really want to share details about them, but both of them are very similar to this, this frog imagery as I gave. The change is too slow, the change is too subtle to notice. And, uh, and it took someone else coming in. Like, like the prophet Joel. Yeah, exactly. So it took someone else kind of <coughs> talking to me and yeah. helping me. And, like, giving me the tools to kind of work on the situation and realize my situation. It's, you can't like repair or turn the situation around or take any action until you realize what's happening sometimes. Yeah, and I, and I think that Joel specifically, the book we're studying now, is in the Bible to be read by people in that situation, or by peoples, nations, churches, whatever, groups of people, individual people. It's just the human condition, right? And, and, and Joel speaks into that human condition at a certain point, place, and time. It really doesn't matter where and when so much, because it's, it's still true.
Some people have said maybe Joel is actually liturgical, which means that it, it, in the history of the church, they might have actually recited this in worship, you know, in, in Israel, where they wanted to remind themselves of these points when they were gathered together for worship, just like some people read the Psalm 23 or whatever, you know, that, uh, it, you know, to just remind yourself, remind yourself of this, of this kind of thing. <coughs> Okay, I apologize for being five minutes late. Let me pray so you can work up. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for being a God who speaks to his people. We thank you for being a God who is a loving Father and who causes everything to work to the good of those who, who are your children, who love you. When we have bad times, Lord, we pray that you bring to our mind this important truth, just like Jesus said that we will have trouble, but he's overcome the world. Nothing really ultimately bad can happen to a Christian because it's all been redeemed by Christ and made good in the end. And we have that faith and that hope. We're so fortunate, Lord, and we, we, we're so sad that there are people in the world who don't have uh, this kind of hope, who have to actually live in this world without it. We pray that you give us opportunities to tell them about the salvation that you've offered in, in Christ and that many more people could share this wonderful blessing that, that we have. And thank you for each person who could come here tonight. Please help everybody get home safely. And as always, we pray for this church and the people who worship here and the pastors who minister here. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.